Men of the East, men of Washington, you have given the toil and even the blood of your brothers and fellows for four years and spent three thousand million dollars. Your triumph makes the cost cheap. Lend now a few thousand of men and a hundred millions of money to create a new republic, to marry the nation of the Atlantic to an equal, if not greater, nation of the Pacific. Here is payment for your great debt. Here is wealth unbounded. Here, the commerce of the world. Here, the completion of a republic that is continental. But you must come and take them with the locomotive. All right, now, no one move. It began here, on a cold, gray day in December, 1863, on the banks of the Missouri, at the muddy little village of Omaha in Nebraska Territory. And here, 1,800 miles west, where the Sacramento and the American rivers meet, at the new capital of California, Sacramento. At the groundbreaking ceremonies for the Central Pacific Railroad, Governor Leland Stanford was addressing the crowd. I congratulate you upon the commencement of this great work, which is the result of the state of California and the Pacific Coast. Yes, to the nation itself. Carlos Huntington, vice president of the Central Pacific Railroad, was understandably cynical about the difficulties of construction. Who could build a railroad across mountains like the Sierras? If you want to be jubilant over the driving of the first spike, go ahead. I don't. Those mountains over there look much too ugly, and I can see too much work ahead. We may fail. Anyone can drive the first spike. But there are many months of labor and unrest between the first and the last spike. Wood. Wood for ties to support the iron rails. And the driving of the spikes began. The Central Pacific started east towards Omaha. Near Omaha, the Union Pacific was looking westward across the plains. The financial and supply problems of construction were staggering. One day, in mid-November of 1865, General William T. Sherman road to the end of the track. This is a great enterprise, but I hardly expect to live to see it completed. <laughs> the Civil War had ended. Supplies and labor were becoming more plentiful. Charles Crocker, construction supervisor for the Central Pacific, began to hire Chinese immigrants. Out on the prairie, General Jack Casement and his brother Dan had contracted with the Union Pacific for track laying and much of the grading. 
By spring 1866, the track layers, working several miles behind the graders, were laying better than a mile of track a day. They attacked the level Platte Valley with a hundred teams of horses and a thousand men. Listen well. Your young men have destroyed the fine timber and the green grass and have burnt up the country. They have killed my game and my buffalo. They did not kill them to eat. They left them there to rot where they fell. Were I to go to your country to kill your cattle, what would you say? Would that not be wrong and cause war? Summer brought intense heat across the prairie. Work was a gigantic effort. When winter came, driving blizzards raked the open plains, making work impossible. Beginning not far from Omaha and continuing all the way to Utah, physical hardship took its toll. Harsh working conditions and raids by Native Americans caused many to die. Those who fell often left only personal belongings to mark their passing. A group of three men left last Friday to see the placement for a cut up about five miles from here. It's been snowing since that night. They should have been back three days ago. We still haven't seen them. This morning, the entire party laid out a sidetrack for our temporary bridge. We heard last night that the Indians were fighting hard yesterday. They killed two men in our forward party. In 1866, the Union Pacific wintered west of Omaha at the fork of the Platte River. The construction crews became restless during the winter months. They were eager for a change of pace. The result was this first hell on wheels called North Platte. This type of town followed the railroad crews all the way to Promontory Summit in northern Utah. As the Union Pacific remained idle in North Platte during the bitter cold winter of 1866 and 67, a thousand miles to the west, the Central Pacific was storming the Sierra Nevada. The torrential spring rains in the Dutch Flats area had subsided. And the army of Chinese immigrants, which now numbered 10,000, began tunneling through the solid granite toward the summit of Donner Pass. For two years, they would labor in the bitter cold granite caves. And with simple tools, immense endurance and courage, accomplish a feat of excavation and construction never before equaled in railroad history. The summit tunnel was to be the longest on any railroad, 1,659 feet through solid granite. Hey, 
Now, the Chinese experiment has proved imminently successful. They're faithful and industrious. Many of them are becoming experts in drilling and blasting, and the other departments are rock work. With black powder, hammer, and chisel, they moved forward at the agonizing rate of about eight inches a day. As the titanic snows of that winter began to bury the summit in a 40-foot fall, the Chinese gangs carved snow tunnels from their shacks to the excavations. In some instances, the camps were carried away by snow slides, and the men were buried. Many of them were not found until the snow melted the next spring. Working round-the-clock shifts, they seldom saw daylight through that long and bitter winter. The Central Pacific laid only 39 miles of track during 1866 at a cost of $8 million. But those 39 miles may have been the most difficult ever surmounted by any railroad. The crushing snows and zero-degree weather that had confined the Union Pacific's track force to North Platte was followed by devastating floods in spring. But despite the floods, the Union Pacific reached Cheyenne in mid-November of 1867. In April of 1868, Casement's work team moved over and down the west slope of the Wyoming Black Hills and founded Laramie. As the graders pushed west, the country became more and more desolate and sterile. Eighteen sixty eight was a remarkable year of progress for Central Pacific's James Strobridge. His Chinese graders and Irish track layers put down three hundred and fifty miles of track across the Nevada desert at better than a mile per working day. The alkali is always in our throats and nostrils. Many are bleeding at the lungs. The water, too, is unfit to drink, and even useless for making steam, owing to the foreign substances held in solution in it. By Christmas week, 1868, the Union Pacific tracks had reached Echo Canyon, Utah. With the United States Congress and the heads of both railroads unable to agree on where the track should meet, both railroads went dashing across Utah from opposite directions. race was on. Each company was trying to reach Ogden first, and thus control the traffic and trade of the Great Salt Lake Basin. The Union Pacific reached Ogden first on March 3rd, 1869. A month later, its tracks had reached Karen. 25 miles to the north and west. By then, the Central Pacific was still west of the northern part of the Great Salt Lake. And since no meeting point had yet been agreed upon, the grading gangs of both railroads were pushing on as fast as possible. All across Promontory, in a final burst of fierce competition, the railroads were building grade alongside each other in opposite directions. This frantic competition finally ended on April the 9th. Promontory Summit was the connection point agreed upon. All grading ended two days later. The following week, the track layers had narrowed their gap to only 50 miles. 
And in a final burst of enthusiasm, the Central Pacific laid 10 miles of track in one day. The Union Pacific sent engine 119 heading for Promontory, the last end of track. Leland Stanford's special train, pulled by a locomotive named Jupiter, advanced down the Central Pacific line. The morning of May 10th, 1869, was bright clear and cool at Promontory Summit. A telegrapher's key awaited the hand that would tell the world that the Atlantic touches the Pacific. We have got done praying. The spike is about to be presented. What was it the engine said? Pilots touching head to head, facing on a single track, half a world behind each back. D O N E. Done. The celebration at Promontory was modest, but elsewhere... There can never be, in the history of railroad enterprise on this continent, another occasion so full of cause for triumph and mutual celebration as that we celebrate today. The printing press. The steam engine, the telegraph. Why, it opens a whole new era. That first thin line of iron rails was a fact. And more than that, a prophecy, a portent of things to come. And they came fast. There was the swift extermination of the once great buffalo herds. Hunters and supplies were carried right into the field by the railroad, and the hides transported back to eastern markets. The Indian Wars ended. With the buffalo gone, the way of life of the Plains Indians national